Praise God. Well, hey, we're in uh, the 10th uh, part of our series, uh, The Church at Ephesus. We're, we're getting there. We, we've, uh, we've gone through four chapters, and there's six. So I guess you could say we're two-thirds done. Not that we're rushing. We're just taking it as it comes. And uh, praise God for that. So you know where to turn to. You can turn to Ephesians. And uh, chapter 5 is where we're going to get started and uh, soon. So praise God. Um, but uh, so anyway, or if you're in your uh, phones, get your Bibles out and, or your phones out and click there to that, that part of the thing. So um, that part of Scripture. Uh, two weeks ago, we finished up on chapter 4 and uh, entitled, Living as Children of Light. I don't know about you, but man, I really want to live as children of light, right? As a child of God, I want to be in the light. And uh, in the last couple of messages of Ephesians, uh, we have been under the subtitle of that. And, uh, but it's interesting. In, in chapter 5, unlike most uh, chapters, there's no subtitle. It's just Paul just keeps going. So it's really under that subtitle of living as children of light. I think so we're still in that same vein. So we're, we're talking about righteousness, of course, and living uh, like we set up today. God's holy, and we want to live in, in that sense in holiness. So, um, so he continues to tell us, how we can live as children of light. And so, how many would like to know that, right? I do too as well. So let's pray, and then we will get into God's Word. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your Word today, God. Your Word is life, it's truth, it's, it's everything we need, Lord. It's what, what we need as a society, what ails us, God. We need your Word, and we thank you for your Word. We need it in our individual lives, Lord, because your Word is, is a, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We, Lord, help us to, to live as children of light. And where there's, where there's any places where we're not, Lord, where, where, that, where there's that darkness, just expose it and, and help us to, the light to be shined in more and more, God. Don't allow us to walk in those things of darkness, but let us walk in the light. Let us walk in Jesus. And so, Father, take this uh, message you've, you've put on my, upon my heart, and Lord, would you uh, anoint it, and would you just use it today for your glory, God. Lord, these lips are feeble, but Lord, when your anointing's on it, God, they, they can, it can say and do powerful things in the lives of people, not because of who's up here, but because, God, you speak to hearts, and you speak, uh, Lord, to hearts through your spirit, and not, not through any, ultimately any man, but Lord, take the word and just multiply it, and just in, in, enlighten it in us, and I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, um, so let's start out. I'm going to start right away with reading uh, chapter 5 in Ephesians, and we'll start with verse 1 and 2. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. My message today is four words. The first four words in, in that verse 1. Be imitators of God. Amen. Okay, we're done with the message today. We can all go home. Seriously, think about that. Be imitators of God. If we were truly imitators of God, hey, we're there, right? We're there. I, we all know it's a process going on and on and on. But I'm just kidding. Please don't leave. Don't get up and leave. We're not done quite yet. You know, pastors, we can't have four words and then just say, goodbye, have a blessed day, everybody. Although, that might be effective sometime. We should, I, maybe I should try that. It might really work. All they're thinking about all week is be imitators of God. Because sometimes if we could, we could talk for four hours up here, what did he say? I don't know anything he said. But if I said, be imitators of God, now go home and be imitators of God all week. You're like, be imitators of God. Yeah, be imitators of God. Amen. But you're not getting off that easy today. We'll get you out of here early because we started early and all that good stuff today. But um, I could do a long series on be imitators of God. You could go a really long series on being an imitator, you know, with those four words. Just be an imitator of God. I mean, because we look at Jesus' life and it's just... Oh, my word. I mean, it's, just, it's all there, right? In God and Jesus, obviously. And so be imitators. And so we could go on and on, but we're not good at today. So let me just get started by saying this. You are loved. I am loved. If you don't think you are, think about all the stuff you did before you were saved. He loved you anyway. Think about all the sins and some things we still do when we're saved and we still need God's forgiveness, right? I mean, it's not like, okay, we need, never need God's forgiveness after we come to Christ. Yeah, we, we still do. Um, but, you know, I, have, I sensed when I wrote this a month ago, I sensed that the Lord would have me to say this at this time and just to look at the camera. And so I'm going to look at the camera, and I want to say these things because maybe you're watching this on YouTube. This could be a week, this week. It could be a month. It could be a year. And you're not sure if you're saved. You're not sure if you're loved. Try surrendering your life to Christ. And you will know and you will come to understand unconditional love. 
Because unconditional love is what God gives. We don't give that. That's called agape. But we, we, we can't quite get there but, and do that. But Jesus Christ, his love is unconditional. And he loves you just the way you are. But he also loves you enough not to keep you just the way you are. He has so much more for you than you'll ever know. Hallelujah. Much more. And you will discover that as you surrender your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. You will come into that revelation that, wow, there is so much more. I remember after I got saved, I was like, wow, my eyes have been opened. Did anybody else kind of see that spiritually speaking? It's like, whoa, I see the world in a different light. It's almost like the blinders were taken off. And I began to see things that I never saw before. And that's what can happen to you. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you begin to see things, just not what you see in front of you, but all of a sudden, your horizons will begin to expand. No, append, no, no, uh, no pun, right? New horizons. Your, your horizons will become new. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So just ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins and come into your life and in your heart, and he will. It's really that simple. You know, sometimes we make it so complicated, it's really that simple. Yes, and, and not only that, but you can change and you, and you can follow Jesus for the rest of your life. Hallelujah. You'll never be the same. You won't. He'll take you and he'll make you into something new. Praise God. You know, I normally don't say those things in the beginning, but I just felt to do that this time. And so I just need to be obedient to the Lord. And uh, normally that comes at the end of service and that's okay too. So, but um, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So before we move on with this message, Church, let's pray that when we, uh, not only on ours, but all these other, uh, there's so many avenues out there where pastors are on, uh, on the internet now. Let's pray for them, that God would use these things. Of course, ours, but all these other ones, because there are many people, that, more people now that are unchurched than ever before, but, but we have, they have a way to, in the privacy of their own home, without feeling this conviction, if you will, being in the church house or feeling uncomfortable meeting people and being around people they don't know, they can click that, one click, they're there. They're listening to the gospel. So let's keep praying that God uses YouTube and Facebook and, and uh, all the things that are out there to reach people. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, back to verse 1 and 2. Uh, th these, these verses are urging us uh, on to a mutual love. If we're going to be imitators of God, we need to do what the popular wristband that we wore in the, I think it was mid, late 90s, early 2000s, said it said WWJD, and I know most of you can tell me what that means. What would Jesus do, right? Because God, through his son, forgave you and he forgave me. Therefore, we need to be followers of God. And uh, not only that, but we need to be imitators of Christ, right? And imitators of what he did. Um, and, and, you know, we always encourage our children to imitate uh, their parents, especially in, in what is good, and that, to know that they are loved by them, but to imitate the things that they see that are good. Now, there's some things my kids, I wouldn't want them to imitate were, <laughs> some of the stuff that I, how I was, because I was still, and I still am, a pro, uh, process, uh, you know, in grace. But I, some of those things I wouldn't want them to imitate, but there's definitely some things I do want them to imitate that, you know, those godly things. And so, so but we are made in God's image and as God's children. And we are required, really, to re reflect and resemble God. This is just practical religion 101. You know what I'm saying? And so we must be holy as he is holy. We must be merciful as he is merciful. We must be perfect as he is perfect. Now, some people will take that like, oh, i got to be perfect. No, in other words, aiming for that perfection, aiming to be more like Christ. We must love one another as he loved us, Right? And that's the key, and that's really what brings all this together. When we have that love in there, boy, things can happen. Things can change. But love should be the driving force for everything we do, whether we're handing out socks, whether we're handing out food, whether we're smiling at a person at Meyer. Whatever we do, love should be the driving force because we love people. We don't want to jump real quick and say, oh, this person, ugh. No, we, we want to love them into the kingdom somehow. And, and so that should be the driving force of what we do as Christians. Hallelujah. And the base from which it's done. Because if that's the base, people are going to feel that in their spirit. They're going to pick that up and they're going to know that this guy really cares about me. This gal really cares about me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And when we do that, we're going to obviously reflect the Lord. So um, we, we all share in that love, right? Because, because he's shown us that love first. That's why we can share that love. Because he's shown us that love. And, and then we just take that love and we share it with others. I don't know about you, but I have a love for people that I didn't have before I got saved. 
It's not always there, but there's definitely a love for people, especially if I'm in the right spirit, there's a love for people to just see them come to Jesus and a compassion to see them, you know, just know the things of God. It's, it could be so much better. In fact, there was a, there's a guy that's been getting food at Street Life for a few weeks now, or since week, because we're just grabbing, they're grabbing food and going, and I forget about who this guy is, so... For, He'll be sitting on the little brick ledge there, and he'll be eating. And yesterday, I had to walk out to my car and say, hey, you know, I just looked at him. And he, what are you looking at? And he said a few other things. Let me say that it wasn't pretty what he said to me. I won't even repeat it here. And he said some things, and I thought, you know, it's funny that you, it's back in times that would really hurt me, but it's like, I, I know it's not him. He, he's struggling with things. He's, he's, he's hurting. And so he just cussed me out, and he's done this like for weeks in a row. And he's not only that, he goes through the line, and he's, and where's Sue? Sue know what I'm talking about. He's, he's not nice to the people in the line. I'm just like, but he's hurting. He's just hurting very deeply. And so even though we reach out to him in love and he's like that way, that's okay. Just keep praying for him. Just keep loving on him. He just needs Jesus, that's all. He, and Jesus comes in. He'll be coming up to me, brother, man, thank you. I thank you guys for serving. We love you, man. It'll be a whole different ballgame when he finds Jesus. Amen. Trust me, it'll be a whole different ballgame. Yeah, absolutely it will. So praise God. So devil, you're a liar. God, touch him right now in Jesus' name. Touch him right now, Lord. Touch him in Jesus' name. Get him, heal him, save him. Do it, Lord. Hallelujah. But unlike our human parents who, uh, who were and are uh, sinners, uh, if, if they're still alive. God is, God is different. God, he's good. He's upright uh, all the time and without sin. And if you keep imitating him, your life's going to be good. Amen. You're going to be good. If you obey this word, it's going to be good. I didn't say perfect because it's not going to be without trials or tribulations. How many have, besides me have had a trial or tribulation since you become a Christian? Yeah. Nah, I think I'm in good company here. I mean, you, it doesn't all go away. But even God uses that. Even God uses that. In fact, I think we grow more. I know we grow more in those things than we do when everything's going peachy cream, when we're tiny Tim, tip and throw to the, to the tulips. Everything's better and goes. And we grow more in the, in the tribulations and the trials. Amen. Hallelujah. But it will be good here, and it'll be a whole lot greater up there when, if we're walking with Jesus. Hallelujah. All right, let's move on to verse 3. Here we go. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Now, I want to address that last part uh, a moment where it states that, um, that uh, Christ gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and uh, as a sacrifice to God, okay? Um, now, the, the thing with that and... I think I, I'm thinking of another verse. But anyway, he gave us himself up. I didn't, I didn't put the verse here. He gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, okay? Um, I, like, I like being around good-smelling stuff. Amen. The home is nice after someone cooks apple pie. Now, you notice I said someone. I didn't say me. For whatever reason, I still have never baked a thing in my life. Now, I eat the, I eat the spatula with the batter. I'm good at that. But I haven't baked. I don't know why. I just have never baked. I do some cooking and... Sometimes that's even bad, but anyway, you can, when you burn hot dogs, you know it's not good. But anyway, I do some cooking, um, but, but maybe it smells like jasmine, sweet pea, uh, and the sweet pea candle burning in your house, you know, for hours and hours in the winter, how you have those candles. That's what I looked at at our table, and I didn't buy it. I, I, well, either my daughter or, I don't know, one of the, one of the uh, who knows who bought it. But anyway, it was in there. I'm going, look at that name, sweet pea and jasmine, whatever. But when you get those things, when you get those things, these aromas in the air, it smells really good. On the other hand, I don't enjoy being around rotten food smell in the house, especially in the summer and the humidity. You know what I'm saying? It's not good when you get rotten food. And we have to ask ourselves, what kind of smell are we putting off? What's our attitudes? What's our words? What's our actions? What are we putting out there for people? What are we, what are we setting in front of them? Is it sweet like grandma's apple pie? Boy, my mom, she could make an apple pie. That thing was just, that crust was like floating in the air. That thing was up about that high. I don't know how she did it. It rose and it just stayed there. Okay, sorry, making you guys hungry. But it, but, but it was so sweet, the whole house just smelled, right? And uh, is it like that candle? Or do people not want to be around you? They get around you and they're like, ugh, I feel this heaviness. I feel this weight. They don't want to be there because there's something going on. It's just not good. Is it rotten like that spoiled food in the fridge or in the garbage can, Right? This, that won't draw anybody, but it's something to think about. But here's something else to think about. 2 Corinthians 2, chapter 2, verse 14 through 16a. But thanks be to God 
who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are told, or we are, for we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved, those who are perishing, to, to the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. And there's that scripture I just mentioned. A fragrant offering, a sacrifice pleasing to God is mentioned many times in the Old Testament. Biblically, it has to do with the clean animals that they sacrificed and which satisfied, satisfied God's requirements. He was pleased with their sacrifice. We see it first in Genesis chapter 8, numerous times in Leviticus and in the New Testament, where Christ is the final sacrifice now, we know, for sin, and his father was well pleased with him, his son. Thank you, Lord. So yeah, I took a little liberty to bring up the apple pie and the candles, but it's important that we give off a smell, spiritually speaking, that is pleasing and aroma to other people, that they want to be around us. It's coming out of our house, almost like you see in a cartoon where the smell is kind of drifting and it's going out. They want to be around our house. There's something, there's a good presence in our house. The coworkers want to be around us. Our neighborhoods, neighbors want to be around us in the neighborhood. There's something about us that's just full of light and full of draw. It draws people. There's a sweetness about us. Do you know what I'm talking about? Those people you want to be around, you're just like, man, I just could talk to this person all day. They're just so refreshing and so encouraging, all those things. So let's be those people, amen? Praise God. All right, verse 3, hallelujah. All right, so, but among you, actually, you know what? I know what happened. I read, verse, I read the wrong verse last time. That was verse 2. Now, I'm, now we're to verse 3. Okay, so last time I, it was the other verse. So here we go, verse 3. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Mm. Paul tells us in Colossians 3.5, to put to death, therefore, whatever, whatever, belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, uh, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. King James uses the word fornication. Instead, but this verse is referring to all acts of sexual immorality. And included that is, of course, fornication, which is sexual intercourse outside of marriage. Uh, we've got, in that would be adultery, which, of course, is uh, sexual intercourse with someone other than your spouse. And also we have homosexuality, of course, would be part of that. Uh, sexual relations with someone of the same sex, okay? So all those could obviously fit in there. Um, but you'll also notice the word impurity, Notice that's in there. And in that verse, uh, there's many other things could go into that verse, uh, such as viewing pornography, lusting after a woman or a man. Uh, all those things could be included in that. And you say, ouch, pastor, who? you're getting close to home. Stop. Trust me, I understand. Men, we were made to be attracted to women. Men? Amen. We, were made, we were made to be attracted to women. I, that's not, I mean, that's just the way it is. But it's what we do with that attraction it's what we do with our eyes and what we do with our hearts, right? After seeing that attractive woman, that determines whether or not we will allow it to become lust, right? That's, right. That's the bottom line. It's, you know, the fact that you see an attractive woman, okay, well, God put them there, great. But the, you know, where, where you go from there is, is, gets to be the issue or gets to be the problem, right? Ladies, for, maybe for you, it's maybe a struggle with gossip or jealousy or who knows what it is. I don't know what it is. But here's my, here's my encouragement today to you. Don't focus on the thought, I keep on sinning. Instead, keep on winning. Amen. Keep on winning. Bring the sin to the cross. Keep on fighting the good fight of faith. And you will break through. Just keep Amen. on fighting. Don't stop. Don't, let me, don't be defeated. Amen. Don't be defeated by these things. Keep pressing forward. Hallelujah. You'll get the victory in Jesus' name. I find it interesting. When the teachers of the law brought the woman caught in adultery... They brought him there to trap Jesus. See what he would say. What does Jesus do? Of all things, he bends down. He's doing this. What? What? What is, it, what is all that about, right? Right? You notice Jesus doesn't say, I can't believe this lady. She commits adultery. What is wrong with her? She's terrible. Right? He doesn't say that. He also doesn't say, great job, guys. Thanks for pointing it out. You guys rock. You're so holy. She's terrible. 
Doesn't say that either, does he? Doesn't say either one of those things, does he? Shh, no, not at all. Instead, he says, if any of you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. One by one, they leave. And what does Jesus do once again? <laughs> in the midst of all this, he's down again. He's, he's, he's writing in the sand, the dirt, whatever you want to call it there. Probably sand in that, in that area. And then he asks her, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She answers, no one, sir. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. He dealt with the sin of both the accusers and the accused. Amen. Look how he did it, though. Think of that, how he did that. With both there, he's in, and I see it as, you know, he gets down on his knees. He's in a posture of humility. The way I would see that, bending down, he does it in a posture of humility. Let me just say this. There is, Romans 8, 1 says, therefore now no, no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You sin, you confess it, ask God to forgive you, and you move forward. Try, and you, you turn from your way and try, you know, obviously not to do that again and say, I'm going to change my ways, my heart, my mind, my thoughts, everything, and move forward in that. And that's what we do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And God forgives us and we move forward. Thank you, Lord. There is no condemnation, so don't carry that around and go, oh, gosh, I've car I, I'm terrible. I just keep doing this, or I said that, or I did it. Okay, I don't think those, ap those apostles looked really holy most of the time. They were doing some crazy stuff. They were doing some, when I, when I see those apostles, I get a little bit of hope because I think these guys, were, these guys were out there, man. These guys were doing some stuff. Well, we all do stuff, and Jesus knew that. That's why he came and went there because he knew we had stuff, Amen. right? Amen. Right. So, but there is another word in that verse I want to mention, and it says it's greed or covetousness, as it states in the King James. And the best way I can describe that is never able to get enough. Never able to get enough. Always wanting more. Never satisfied. We've probably all been there at some point in our lives where we're just not satisfied. We can't get enough. I think, quite frankly, our society, <laughs> our society fills us with that stuff, doesn't it? It's all the time, and, and so we have to fight that off all the time. But my favorite verse to comfort, uh, to comfort or to combat, I should say, greed is this. It's found in 1 Timothy 6, 6 and 7. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen. Think about that. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. Ain't nothing going with you. I was talking to Gabe and Malik Wednesday night. We were in the office. We were talking about this. I'll never forget what Pastor Benson said. I've never seen a U-Haul behind the hearse. Right. How true. We don't take that stuff with us. If you have Christ in your heart, you've got everything you need. You've got everything you need. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And what you don't have, he can provide. So just be faithful in your life and the little things. Be faithful in your tithes and your offerings. The things God's asked you to do, and God will take care of the rest. Amen? I've, I'll just say it for a second. I've seen it in my own life financially. I've seen it in this church's life. When we're faithful to do what God's called us to do, he'll take care of the rest. I don't walk around, thank God, worrying about, oh, my gosh, are we going to be open next week? I never think about it. God has blessed the church. Why has he blessed the church? Look on the board out there. I don't need to say no more. Who do we support? What are we, we're doing the, if you do the kingdom of God or the work of God, he'll take care of your needs. If you're faithful to the things of God, he'll take care of you. Whether that's financially, whether that's mentally, whether that's emotionally, whether that's physically, whatever, he can take care of you. Hallelujah, and he will. So we have justified every sin in the last 50 plus years and probably all, all the way through, but, but really a lot more in the last 50 years or so because uh, thanks to my generation which came up with the slogan, if it feels good, do it. Well, it may feel good for a short time, but sin always has its consequences. Yeah. Oh, boy. Now I'm preaching things that nobody wants to hear in 2020. I'm going to start getting eggs thrown at me. I'm going to get spitballs you know, from the back, whatever. I mean, people aren't going to be happy. But just don't say amen there at that part, right? But, but I love you enough to preach the truth. Amen. Hallelujah. And we have to. So let's go to verse 4. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Isn't thanksgiving a, 
antidote or a good thing for a lot of things. It really is a, it's a, it's a healing thing. Thanksgiving takes care of a lot of stuff in our lives. When we can be thankful, boy, it just, all the other stuff kind of just kind of melts away in time. It's like, God, thank you for this. Because we can get so focused on all the things that we don't have and we're struggling with and we're frustrated with. But when we start saying the list of thankful and things we're thankful for, oh my word, how it changes everything. It changed, it changed in here Friday night when we started thanking God for all these different things and praising God. We started out with praise, and then we went into uh, Thanksgiving. And I'm telling you, it changes everything, your outlook, how you feel, how you look, how you see things. When the Bible mentions obscenity, it's referring to filthy language, as it states in the King James, indecent speech, cursing. It is so common in our society, isn't it, that if we're not careful, we can adapt the same type of speech in our vocabulary. Others can do it, but you and I can't. Others can do it, but you and I can't, right? If we want to be a, a good testimony for Jesus Christ and imitate him, as we just read in, in verse 1, obscenity should not be coming out of our mouths because it doesn't reflect God's spirit within us, does it? It doesn't reflect, it's not a good reflection of the Lord. But I tell you, Jesus said, do not swear by either heaven for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool. Three verses later, it says, simply let your, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. All right? Some things I could say that would fit under that foolish talk, in my opinion, would be lying, bullying, boasting, making oaths you can't keep. Because, see, it's taking your testimony away. If you say one thing and you do another, it doesn't look good, does it? doesn't look like you're a man or a woman of your word in those, ca in those cases. Oh, then there's coarse joking. Coarse joking. It seems so innocent. After all, I was only, what? Joking, right? What do they say? After all, I was only joking. The problem with coarse joking is many times it can go to coarse hurting. I heard one of them, hmm, but that's all I heard. Sometimes coarse joking can go to coarse hurting. And that's when it becomes coarse joking. I know when I first got saved, God really dealt with me on this one, boy. Woo, baby. I'd get together with my brothers, and man, we did that for years. We'd get together, and we would start, you know, yucking, yucking it up, and we'd start going after each other, and I'd be going after one, one would come back to me, and then we'd go after the third brother, and the third would go after one, and we'd be just going around and around. We'd be, we'd be going at each other, and we'd be, of course, joking. And uh, the Lord, after I got saved, though, imagine this. God started convicting me of all that. He started saying, mm, that's not proper. That's not good. And so I knew I needed to stop, you know, because here's the thing. Of course, joking attacks people's character and the dignity of a person as it progresses, and it usually gets worse. It doesn't exalt God's goodness. It's interesting, all these years later, it really doesn't come up at all or very little. And when it does, it dies quickly because I'm not joining in. I'm not joining that party. I'm not going to that party. So I just back off or I just be quiet. I don't need to go into that party and go, yeah, well, you, uh, you, went to, you, know, you went to state, so you're a loser. You know, and they're going, you went to Central, you're a loser. You know, whatever, all that kind of stuff. I ain't going there, right? Not going to happen. So, but it's, it's so easy to justify anything, isn't it? In this sinful, rebellious world, there are many activities and behaviors and practices that are common to man, shall we say, uh, but are completely unacceptable and, proper and improper for God's holy people. We want to be God's holy people. It's interesting we had those songs. I, didn't tell, I don't tell Pastor Paul and Karen and them what, what, what you should play up here. It just flows, like many times it flows right into the message because God's a God of order and he knows what he's doing, right? He knows how to orchestrate the services. Hallelujah. And I'm not talking either just about our actions and our conversation, but also about our behavior, uh, the behavior of those we associate with. What are we listening to? Hmm, good question. What are we watching on TV or at the movie theater, I guess? Listen to me, young people, listen very carefully. Who are we hanging with? Who are we hanging with? When I was in California on the first bike trip, I stayed the winter in L.A., and uh, of course, I wasn't saved. This was just a couple years before I came back and got saved. And I was living with, a, uh, I had a friend in Livonia. He, he had other friends, because uh, I just kind of popped in on my friend in Livonia, and that wasn't good. He was living with his girlfriend, and she wasn't happy with me. Of course, I just popped in. Okay? And it's like, hey, here I am. And she's like, here, get out of here. Anyway, so that was another story. But anyway, so then I ended up over at renting an apartment of another guy that he knew from Livonia. And so as we would go out and he, we would go to the bars and he would be like, uh, he'd be like acting, he was a bigger guy and he would act all tough and I started taking that on. Here I was, a 
130 pound weakling. Yes, I was in great shape because of the bike trip. 130 pounds, and I'm starting to act like I'm all that in a bag of chips. I ain't nothing, man. Guy would just go boom, and I'm, I'm flying five feet back, right? But see, because who we hang around with it starts to determine who we are and who we become. So if you keep hanging around those folks, you're going to become like them. They're going to have a, a negative draw on you instead of bringing you up. So we don't want to do that. Man, we don't want to do that. So, so we got to be careful who we're hanging with. Um, and so, because here's the, here's the bottom line. The Bible says bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. We can't deliberately expose ourselves to the entertainment of this world either because it can lead to foolish talk and coarse joking. Sometimes you may be in a group where everyone is using obscenities and everybody's talking foolishly and everybody's doing coarse joking. And then you start to feel like, gosh, if I want to fit in, I need to start doing these things. You ever been there? I got to start acting like they are because they won't think I'm cool. They'll think I'm, I'm straight and I'm really holy or, you know, just really holy, uh, uh, one of those straight people or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Real holy kind of person. And so, but don't do it. Don't join in. God will be pleased and you will be raising up a testimony when they see that you're not doing and partaking in the things that they're doing and they're partaking in. You will make a difference. Like, why, ain't, why isn't Kenny doing what the things he used to do? Man, he used to be right in there with a thick of He cussed like a sailor. He'd course Joe. No, not anymore. Because Jesus came in. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, it's different. It's different. And you notice when you get different, when you get saved, your family's always trying to bring you back or whoever, they're trying, the neighborhood's trying to bring you back. No, 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 no. I'm a different guy. That doesn't mean we go around and say, hey, I'm a holy, you're unholy. No, we just live it out. And we let it out. And they'll see it. It's not that you can't have any fun. General joking is okay. I do it a lot. I just have the wisdom to know when to stop. Right? And when you stop, don't start doing, uh, attacking and degrading and mocking other, others. Right? Don't do that. I joke around all the time, and I, but I try to be very careful how I joke. And if I've ever offended anyone, you come to me, and I'll ask for forgiveness. But I try to be very, very careful with that, about, about what I'm saying. But there's things you can joke about. Life, we take life too serious. We take life too serious. We take ourselves too serious. I could have been all upset with myself for going, I can't believe I asked this guy if he needed socks and he had no legs. Really? How stupid. You know, I could have gone on and on. I went right over to Taylor. I said, Taylor, you're not going to believe what I just did. Because at that point, he stayed by the sidewalk. I just went over there quickly, came back. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> I can't believe I just did that. But praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Life is serious enough. It's good to be lighthearted. Amen. And so we do that often in the board meetings. We'll, 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 Chris, he's always so serious. He never cracks a joke. And so I, I go over there and smack him. No, no. Anyway, so we, we have fun. We, we have some lighthearted fun. And, and it's okay. We're not hurting anybody. And uh, Chris will bring stuff up. I'll joke. Pastor Paul will joke. And Christine will look at us like those three knuckles. They're like the three stooges. And anyway, and Renee will look at us like, what's wrong with those guys? But we have fun, okay? Praise God. All right, let's go to verse 5. All right, here we are. Uh, for of this, you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a man as an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Okay, so also in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, I'm going to read that to you. It says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the swindlers, nor the drunks, drunk, excuse me, the drunkards will inherit the kingdom of God. Folks, it's pretty clear. It's really clear. We want to water these things down, but it's pretty clear. And, and an idolater is a person who worships false gods, right? An image. Uh, we can make idols out of just about anything, can't we? There's so many things we can make idols out of, especially in our world today. But Paul speaks with certainty here as he says, for this you can be sure. I think Paul's being obviously real clear. He knew that people, whether they were in the church or not, could be immoral, impure, or greedy, they were excluded from, and they were be excluded from Christ and God's kingdom. Okay, and so these things can happen. We can continue to sin, but we have to be very careful. And what he's referring to here is people who allow their flesh of any kind to dis, to distract them from the truth of God and His Word. By their behavior, they're just showing that they love the world more than they love God. I don't want to love the world more than God. I loved the world when I was in the world before I got saved. Now I'm saved. I want to love God more than I love the world. Does that make sense? Amen. Hallelujah. They want to please themselves and their flesh more than God himself. <clears throat> Loving this world is spiritual idolatry. Don't get too fond of it because it's all going away soon, church. 
right? These sins can't keep us uh, certain ones out of heaven, but we have to be careful, right? right? If we're not careful, they will keep us out of heaven. That's the thing. We've got to be careful. And so many people today uh, can make a God out of money. We're, we're in a society where we have, we have been blessed more than any nation on earth for a long, long time. And the desire for things and the desire for money in America, it's hard to avoid, like I said earlier, because you have advertisements coming at you all the time. You need this. You're not complete if you don't have that. If you don't have this, hey, you can have this. And, and, but wait, there's more. Chicago 60609. I still remember that from a kid. Anyway, you get that the commercial. Okay. And you can always buy all this stuff on the TV, and everywhere else you go, you can buy stuff. We have to be on our guard against such things because they can bring the wrath of God upon those that are, that are doing or are guilty of doing these things. Now, before you go into thinking, gosh, there's no hope for me, Pastor, <laughs> because I've been sexually immoral, I've been impure, I've been, I've been greedy at times. Uh, first of all, if you're born again, your sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. That doesn't mean, as a Christian, you can't get involved still in habitual sins. We can. You can do that, but stay away from them. Flee. Remember, the Bible says flee, right? We've got to flee those things. Stay away from them. And if you partake, repent, like I said earlier, and, and Jesus forgives you, and then go back and, and do the behavior that you know you need to do, right? You let go of something, put something good in there. We've talked about that earlier in Ephesians. And so he'll help you. God is there for you. He doesn't want you to be bound up in anything. He wants you to be free. Yeah. Hallelujah. Today, so many people uh, want to stay in their, in their sin and justify, justify it by even using the Bible to do so. See, they're not going to be able to do that when they, when, they, when they bow before Jesus, are they? You can't really do that then. You can do it now. You can tell man, hey, I'm, I'm getting away with it. And I think the word means this. The, the word means that. No, right? But if the Bible states the, 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 uh, that the sexually immoral, that those are impure and greedy, if it states idolaters, idolater, uh, uh, idolaters uh, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, drunkards, swindlers, slanders, that, that's what it means. In other words, if those things are continued to live in and never repented of, right? They never came to Christ, then yeah, their, their destiny is not heaven, right? If it's never come to that place where, hey, I'm a sinner, Lord, help me come into my life and my heart. I, I need you. So don't, let's not make excuses for sin. Uh, change our thinking and it'll change our actions, right? Hallelujah. Because here, Jesus came to set the captives free. He who the Son sets free is free, is free indeed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're free, church. Don't go back to bondage. We're free. I'm not going back to hanging over a bowl, toilet bowl and getting sick on Saturday morning. Thank God. Hallelujah. I've been freed from all that stuff, right? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 10, 1, uh, 13. Remember, no temptation is, 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 has seized you except that which is common to man, right? But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Our God's good. He knows and he sees. All right. We're going we're gonna to do the last couple of verses and we'll bring it to a close. Six and seven. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such thing, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Sadly, many people are deceiving, uh, are, are in our society are being deceived into lull and to laziness concerning sin. And it's just, and it's not just, believe me, it's not just non-believers. It's occurring just as fast in the church and with Christian universities and Christian schools. Society tells us the book, that this Bible is antiquated. It's just stories. It's 2,000 years old. It means nothing. I don't know about you, but it's mean, meant a whole lot to me. It's changed my life for the good, not for the bad, for the good. My life was going like this, but I got the Bible in me. It's been going like this ever since. doesn't mean it's perfect. Sometimes it goes like this, but usually it goes like this, and it keeps going like this. It doesn't go like this where it was for the first 25 years of my life. It was going down, folks, and it was going down fast until Jesus stepped in. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Whew. Well, glory to God. So it's real. This thing's living and acting, a double-edged sword. It is real. It's not some fairy tale of stories. That I think I'll agree with this and take this, but I won't take this. I'll take that. No, no, no. You either take it or you don't. It's either the word of God or it's not. How can you do, how can you just take parts of it? Come on. It's the whole thing or it's nothing. Just throw it out and don't even say you're a Christian. If you're not going to live it, just throw it out. Right? Okay. I'm getting into preaching now. Look out. All right. So... You can believe whatever you want and do whatever you want as long as you're a sinner. That's what the world, the, the world will tell you as long as you're sincere. Excuse me. As long as you're sincere, you can do whatever you want. It's, it's okay. It's all right. The problem with that theology is you can be sincerely wrong. 
And then you will suffer the consequences because of the deceptions and the lies that you have been believing, right? Some denominations are telling us people's sin are okay and that God loves you just the way you are. Yeah, God loves you, all right, but he loved you enough to, to give them a way out, right? To give them freedom because he who the Son sets free is free indeed because sin has its consequences. His name is Jesus, and God and Jesus have a beautiful, a good standard of what's acceptable and what's not. Amen. We're held accountable for our choices. If we don't warn people the fact that there is a standard, uh, and especially as myself as a pastor and as teachers, we've got to warn people. But we do it in love because otherwise we're supporting their behavior. They think, oh, it's okay. Pastor thinks it's cool or he's all right with it. Uh, that's fine. But those who commit such sins and those who that teach it, uh, that it that it's okay will have to answer for it and will be held accountable on Judgment Day. I don't want to be held accountable for leading someone else down a path that leads them from heaven. The Bible is clear in John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, he was clearly in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Hallelujah. I'm not showing love to my child if I never discipline him. Those are the worst kids in the world that were never disciplined. They're spoiled brats, I'm just going to tell you. Give them everything and don't discipline them. Those are the worst kids in the world. They can have, their mom and daddy can have millions of dollars. You can take the millions. If I got a spoiled brat, no thank you. I'll take a kid that understands sincerity and love and, 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 and has integrity in their heart. I'll take that kid any day over the other one. So I'm not loving my kids if I don't discipline them, right? I'm just becoming an accomplice to really to, to, to hurting them at the end of the day. I'm not showing love to someone by sharing with them. Man, I'm going long today. Sorry, guys. I guess we were supposed to go early on the other stuff. I'm not showing love to someone by never sharing with them that the, son, um, that the sin that they're committing is wrong before God and that they will be held accountable, right? But again, we do that in love. Hallelujah. Because I've noticed two things about this book, and you guys will get this. Everybody's been in school. It's not pick or choose. Pick the right answer. It's not multiple choice. Is it? Really? It's not. Believe it's false. Don't obey it. Yes, there's going to be consequences. And an eternity, eternity separated from God. Sadly, a lake of fire. Believe it's true, and that's why we're here to tell the good news, the truth. Believe it's true. Follow and obey it. Reap the rewards. Spend eternity with Jesus in heaven forever. Think about that. In heaven forever with Jesus. I don't know how that's going to look, but it's going to be good, church. It's going to be good. Glory. Hallelujah. Yeah, amen. Give God praise in the house today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, PK, that's too simple. And man, you really black and white, dude. You just need to lighten up. You need to chill out. What, what right is it in yours to say what is right and what is wrong? Well, I'm not saying what is right and what is wrong. Here's the, here's the standard. I'm not telling you what's right and wrong. God, God is telling us what's right and wrong. Yeah. It's not me. God did. He spoke the word through people, and they gave us the word. Yeah. And many pastors don't preach that sometimes anymore because they don't want to offend anyone or they don't want to lose members. I'd rather lose someone than have them go to heaven. And, 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 I mean, I'd rather have them offend someone and have them go to heaven than be silent and watch them go to hell. That's, right. That's what I'd rather do. Preach God's word, but in love, and do it in love, and speak to them in love. I'm not going to partner with the devil in his lies. I'm not going to do it. I will not do it. Not caring enough to confront their sin in love and give them the choice to turn from their destructive ways and find Jesus. Because let me tell you, that's a whole nice thing and a whole good thing and a whole better thing. And I'll leave this. I know it's getting hard and I'm preaching today, but Romans 1.8 states it clearly. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Well, PK, what kind of a loving God would send people to hell? God doesn't send anybody to hell. People choose to go to hell. That's my answer. He doesn't send people to hell. When you think about it, think about it, church. Our whole lives are choices. Isn't it choices? I make this choice, and guess what? Because really, when you look at the whole word, what you sow is what you reap. That's really the whole synopsis of the word. What you sow is what you reap. I make choices. And so... I want to sow good things, and I know I'll reap good things. I want to sow Jesus, right? And I know I'm going to reap Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so in his love, uh, but in his love, he has given us a way out, and his name is Jesus. Thank you, Father. If we will accept his sacrifice and forgiveness, we will be in heaven forever with him. One last comment. Verse 7. I want to comment on that, and I will, we will bring it to a close. I got long today. I guess I apologize, but no, I don't. <laughs> Praise God. Anyway, I'll bring this to a close right now. But when it states that we are not to partner with the disobedient, it doesn't mean we can never hang around with non-Christians. How do they get one if we never 
engage non-Christians. Love compels us to love people, to witness to them, plant seeds, water seeds, and if they've already been planted and watered, harvest the seed, right? To bring them in. Loving and bringing people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ when they're ready. That's, we need to do that. But for those whose hearts are hard and they hate God and they promote ungodly lifestyles and evil, don't get caught up doing what they're doing, right? right? They will draw you away from the Lord. So, but when those hearts are half, even some open or, or just seem like there's some, there's some receptibility, be the witness. Love them. Find out where they're at. Don't just say, oh, you homosexual, you're going. No, we don't do that. We just say, you know what, because most homosexuals, they have hurt. And the, many, the studies show most of it's their uh, relationship with their father. And, and find out, get to know them enough to find out where the hurt is and minister God's love into that hurt. Yeah. Minister God's love right there where they need it, right? Yeah. That's, what, that's what's going to make a change. Not going, you. I didn't see Jesus going, you, when the, when the guys came. Because quite frankly, church, I think all, most or not, not all those guys were with that woman. Why are they over there with the stones? You, come on. You, I, I, when I first read that, I'm like, hmm, this sounds a little fishy. I think those guys were the, probably the worst, uh, you know, the worst ones. But anyway, that's another story for another time. So, so God has given you and me a way out of your sin and a way out into his kingdom by his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The choice is yours. Today, the Bible says, is, today is the, the day of salvation. Whether you're listening to me by YouTube, whether you're watching this on YouTube, or whether you're here today, I, I just want to ask you, if you could just close your eyes and bow your head for a moment, and I want to ask you, I'm just going to ask you a simple question. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to call you up front. We're not going to do any of that. We, we want to rejoice with you when you rejoice. And so if, if you say, Pastor, I, I don't know this God that you're talking about in a personal way. I know about God, but I don't know him in a personal way. I'd like to know him personally today as my personal Savior, which means save me from my sin, and Lord, which means leader. Uh, I want to know him that way. If that's you, what I'm going to ask you to do in a minute is just raise your hand, put it right there down and what we're going to do is we're going to pray for you as a church body those that are that, that know jesus and then we're going to rejoice with you uh if, if that's you and you you come to jesus today because let me say this everything changes with Amen. jesus everything changes and so if that's you and you say pastor i would like to know uh jesus christ is my lord and savior i want to know that i know that i know that i'm going to heaven i'm not sure there, there's a little doubt there i want to know if that's you just just everybody's head is bowed so just lift your hand real quickly and say pastor that's me i want to know that i'm going to heaven and uh could you pray for me and we'll pray together all right everybody you can look up praise god i'm going to assume everybody knows jesus christ pastor lois would you come i've asked pastor lois to close us in prayer and uh we will see you after that though we will see you wednesday we are actually in revelation 10 we're almost halfway there after two and a half years praise god so lois, there's a, a microphone right there it's on our thank you everyone Amen. bless the name of Jesus everyone we give God praise today don't we we give him praise today don't we hallelujah hallelujah Lord we thank you for this word that went forth today we thank you Lord God hallelujah for your spirit hallelujah thank you for your presence in this place we thank you Lord for the praise and the worship that have gone up from every heart, oh God. And we're asking you today, Lord, that you will continue, and we know you will, because we know that you love us. Yes. Hallelujah. You love us. And we're not listening to any other voice, but the voice of the word of God. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. For being with us. We thank you for going with us even as we leave this place. We give your name, glory, and praise. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen.